Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. When I was studying science 20, 25 plus years ago, and even when I first came into spirituality 21 years ago, there was really this gap, science and spirituality. And it was People would say, oh, you've gone from science to spirituality. And there would be lots and lots of questions about, you know, how do you, how do you choose which way to see the world? How do you know what to believe? Is it science or is it spirituality? And what's been so exciting in the last couple decades is to start seeing these two things really merge. And here's here's what I love about it a lot is spirituality's been telling us things for thousands of years. Science is wonderful. Every single thing we have here ranging from, you know, my my thermal underwear that's keeping me warm and, you know, how the dual layers, they can put them together to make sure that I stay warm to how the microphone works, to how the camera works, to how the lights work, to how every one of us got here. I mean, presumably we all used some form of vehicle to get here from wherever we come from. Most of us airplanes, maybe some people trains or buses or cars, but every one of us has arrived here through some vehicle that would not be possible if we didn't have science. The problem comes in with where science claims jurisdiction. So science is able to give us truth, and I'm, I'm a proponent of science, I really love science, But its jurisdiction is limited to how good its tools are. What I mean by that is science can only understand things that its tools can measure. So our tools of science are microscopes and telescopes, low-powered, high-powered, electron. I mean, we've got all these different types, but basically... Something that makes something minuscule suddenly visible. Telescopes that bring something far away into our vision. A variety of systems of measurement. We can measure weight. We can measure height. We can measure density. We can measure all sorts of things. Heat and cold and whatnot. But science is truth is only as good as its tools. And so, for example, there was a long period of time on Earth in which in schools, in science class, children were taught that the Earth was flat. It's what the tools of science told us at the time. Earth is flat. It's what kids learned. If on a science exam in those days you had written the Earth is flat, the teacher would have marked it correct. There was a long period of time in which science told us that the whole universe revolved around the earth. Then we got better telescopes. 
And we learned, ah, actually, no. Now, the truth didn't change, but that which science teaches us, that which is published in science books, changes. And it changes based on the tools that science has. So our telescopes were lousy. We thought the earth was flat and that everything revolved around us. Telescopes get better. We develop actually even machines that can go into outer space and look back on the earth. Suddenly our truth changes. Well, the earth hasn't changed. The shape of the earth hasn't changed. The way the universe rotates hasn't changed. But the truth of science has changed. Something that was true a few hundred years ago is no longer true. Now, I don't say that to blame science or criticize science. As I said, I'm a staunch advocate of science, but only to clarify where science's jurisdiction over truth ends. And it ends where the limits of its tools begin. Now, spirituality has used a different tool. The tool of spirituality as we look inward. Now, for most of us, when we begin to meditate, we barely even begin to catch a glimpse of the truth of who we are. We can barely even begin to understand our own reactions, our own emotions. It would be absurdly far-fetched for us to even, even begin to assume that through closing our eyes and meditating, we could understand the nature of the universe. And yet, that's exactly what the sages and the saints and the rishis did. They didn't meditate like we meditate. That was all they did. That was their life. As people in this room are experts in everything ranging from, you know, finance to engineering to sports to you know, whatever all of your, your expertise may be. The rishis were experts in spirituality. That's all they did. And so by the time they were getting truth, they had opened up that channel into a, a collective body of knowledge that most of us just don't have access to. It's not that it's not there. It's just we don't have access to it. You know, and a, a good way to understand this is if you look at the visual spectrum, for example, the color spectrum, the rainbow that we see, we begin with red and we go to purple, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue. But there's actually colors on the spectrum, ultraviolets, infrareds, that our eyes can't see. Insects can see them. If you've ever seen a picture of how a flower looks like to a bee, it's actually amazing. You know, we think, God, how does the bee know where to go, how to get... Well, on the petals of flowers look like runways for bees. We look at a flower and we think yellow. Whole thing looks yellow to us, or orange, or whatever color our eyes see it. But if you're seeing it from the eyes of bees who can see a much greater color spectrum, there's actually runways on the petals of these flowers directing the bees like airplanes straight into the center. Mosquitoes can see heat. Ever wonder why the mosquito, how the mosquitoes know where to find you? They see heat. If you see a picture of what a human body standing, you know, next to a table looks like to a mosquito, well, the table's all dark. The human body is lit up. And this is why the more you move, the more the mosquitoes come after you, because as you move, your body's generating heat, and it's getting brighter and brighter and brighter for the mosquitoes. Now, I share all of this because to us, 
what we can see is what there is. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. But when you have creatures who clearly are not more evolved than we are, who have access to such a greater visual spectrum than we do, then it at least, at least gets our foot in the doorway of maybe, maybe there's stuff out there that we can't see. I mean, if bees can see things we can't see and mosquitoes can see things we can't see, your cats can see things you can't see, they can see in the dark, they're nocturnal. They can see that spectrum. So, so could the rishis and sages, but instead of it being a visual spectrum of infrared and ultraviolet and heat, they could see truth. And some of that truth, science is just beginning to catch up with. I'll give you one of my most favorite examples. So a very fundamental spiritual teaching is you create your reality, right? This is a, this is a really basic but crucial teaching, particularly of the Indian spiritual tradition. Puja Swamiji was speaking about it on the Ghat last night. I was speaking about it on the Ghat last night, of the power of thought. Not just to make our mood. It's not just what I think makes me happy or sad, but literally the power of thought to create our reality. So you think of that as a spiritual teaching. And yeah, we now have machines that I talk about that can measure your waves, but I'm actually going to go somewhere even deeper scientifically with this. In science, they used to talk about two different elements, two different aspects. Things were either particles, matter, or waves, energy. The, the material world was made up of particles and waves. This was basic physics. Slowly, 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 as they watched it with better machines, better tools, as they watched particles and waves, what they found was that sometimes particles turned into waves, and sometimes waves turned into particles. And this, this was, you know, part of when quantum physics started to take off as, wow, you know, it's not actually quite as cut and dry, quite as black and white. It's not only particles and waves. We're watching waves turn into particles. We're watching particles turn into waves. Now, this is, for those of you not super familiar with those terms, what we're talking is we're, wa- we're watching matter turn into energy. We're watching energy turn into matter. But then recently, they've gone a step further. And they've identified something they call the observer effect. Now, this is not something out of spiritual teachings. This is something out of physics. And what the observer effect says is, actually, whether it's a particle or a wave can can be determined, can be due to, Not just the nature of this thing, but the person watching it. Now, this is, this is so exciting that it literally gives me goosebumps even under my thermal, thermal underwear, because the fact that I could look at something and it could be a wave and you could look at the same thing and it could be a particle and that physics is now telling us this. Is, is such an almost perfect overlap with what the rishis and the sages have said thousands of years ago. We create our reality. How you see it is how it is. And if on the most basic, basic, fundamental, elementary level of matter and energy, who's looking how long they're looking is changing the very nature of the thing they're looking at. So then you say, well, is that, is that science or is that spirituality? Right? Well, yeah, yes and yes. 
and this is this is what's starting to get so exciting and it's reaching into medicine you know we're now in 2018 so 10 years ago when i finally finished my phd i i did my dissertation on the role of what we think how we feel what we believe on our immune systems. Now, the research has even come along a really far away in just the last 10 years. But if you go back 10, 15, 20 years before that, that was absurd. There's no way anybody would have let me do a PhD dissertation on that. I mean, maybe if it were, you know, a yoga institute or something, but because there was there was no scientifically acknowledged interaction of that depth we didn't we didn't know that our emotions talked to our immune system we talked about mind over matter we talked about body and mind but this incredible overlap And now, now slowly, 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 they're starting to actually give us the biological aspects of that. How does it work? Science just says it's there. I mean, sorry, spirituality just says it's there. Science looks at how is it there. So we're now starting to see receptors, for example, in our immune system cells for, for emotional neurotransmitters, which is really exciting. So again, this is, this is where they start, they start to overlap. But I think the most basic element of it really for me is that as science's tools get better, the discoveries of science are coming closer and closer and closer to telling us what spirituality has been telling us for thousands of years. And... On the one hand, that could make those of us who are spiritual people kind of annoyed because you could feel like, well, I mean, yeah, finally, right? I mean, these, these, are, these are people who are saying we're discovering this and this is, you know, some invention and over here it's been written thousands of years ago. But actually, instead of feeling frustrated, it makes me really excited because I don't have an attachment to why people embark on a spiritual path. I don't have an attachment to what their motivation or their agenda is. And if their agenda is because now the Mayo Clinic says that, you know, meditating is good for your health or it helps prevent heart attacks and that's why they've started meditating, so be it. There's no, there's no scripture that I've heard of that says, you know, you're a better person if you start meditating because you're looking for enlightenment than if you start meditating to prevent a heart attack. Point is meditate, regardless of why you do it. Because even if you get into it to prevent your heart attack, the power of meditation is so much, it's going to take you there. It's like, you know, people ask about yoga all the time. They'll say, well, don't you, doesn't it bother you that people just get into yoga to get fit? Or doesn't it bother you that people do yoga just to lose weight? And I always say, I don't care why people come to yoga. If we limited yoga and meditation to people who came to it because they were already on a spiritual path, we'd find ourselves constantly just preaching to the choir. Because these are disciplines that now the scientific world is starting to say, this is good for your health. This lowers blood pressure. And that people are getting into it for that has opened up the possibility of reaching people who otherwise never, never would have come to a spiritual path. And for us, us to begrudge them that feels ridiculous. 
let everybody, let everybody meditate, let everybody do yoga and whether they get into it because, you know, their chiropractor or physiotherapist said it or their cardiologist said it. Who cares? The power of yoga, the power of meditation as spiritual practices are so deep that they're going to impact you regardless of why you get in. So if, if your science is bringing you to spirituality, fantastic. You don't need to let go of the science. In fact, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. In fact, prior to coming to India and even, even up until now, if I remove experiences I've had from my consciousness temporarily. The the greatest evidence that I have for the fact that God exists is actually in science. Yes, I've been I've been very blessed to personally have those experiences. But in terms of evidence I would never expect someone to take my word for something. I would never say, well, you should believe it exists because I've had this experience. That's not, you know, I mean, if you want to believe it because you trust me or you love me, well, that's great. But but I would never rely on that. I would never expect you to believe something just because I was saying it, just because I had had an experience. And for me, science actually gives us the very best evidence. And the evidence is this. In a science laboratory, anybody who's ever spent time in a science laboratory knows that we can create a lot of things. We've got Petri dishes. We've got Bunsen burners. We've got test tubes. We've got beakers. We've got all of our materials. And if you've got a really good science teacher or you're working from a really good science book, you know that when you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you put them in your crucible and you turn on your Bunsen burner, that something's going to happen. Now, typically what happens is you get, you know, some smoke or you get a bad smell or you get something like that. But science also, as I began, is what helps us make things. It, you know, makes my thermals. It teaches us how to make the microphone or make the camera or make the lights. But what science cannot create is life. And if we don't even think about humans and you simply think about a leaf, think about a mosquito, think about an amoeba, well, biologists could tell you exactly exactly how that leaf is made. They could tell you exactly how much carbon, how much hydrogen, how much nitrogen, how much oxygen. They even could tell you how the molecules are bonded together. They could do with those, you know, Lego type of things with the styrofoam balls and rods and whatnot and show you how the molecules bind together. They could draw a full picture of exactly how that leaf, the structure of it, But you can't, you can't create life in a Petri dish. Even knowing everything. After inventing everything, discovering everything, understanding everything, they cannot replicate it. The very best that we've ever been able to do at the highest level of this biological science is cloning. So the best we can do is take something that already exists and simply replicate it. We cannot create life. Which to me, from a scientific perspective, says, okay, now wait. Our highest best scientists who have studied and learned and mastered every aspect of the physical world from the Big Bang to this moment cannot create a mosquito or a leaf in a Petri dish. And you expect us to believe that this just randomly happened? Like, 
things just bounced off each other and it randomly happened, when even knowing what was bouncing off each other and at what speed and at what temperature we still can't create it, in any of the best laboratories in the world, with any of our Nobel Prize winning scientists in the world, not even once, not even a spark of life that died 24 hours later, So to me, that for me has always been actually the greatest evidence. Not of science over spirituality or spirituality over science, but of the, of the awareness that, yeah, there was a Big Bang. Yeah, there's been evolution. Yes, of course, all of this has, has evolved the way scientists say. But there obviously had to be someone, something who knew very clearly what they were doing. Some capital P planner who put this whole thing in motion. Because otherwise you don't get life. It does, life does not come randomly. We get genetic mutations, we get evolution, we get all of that, but you don't get life. And so if science, in my humble opinion, would simply, simply take a deep breath and simply enjoy and feel proud of all of the domains over which it really has mastered things and really has understood things, and not try to claim jurisdiction over domains that it cannot understand simply because it doesn't have the tools. There may come a time when science can explain God that our tools are going to get bigger and bigger and better and better and finer and finer and subtler and subtler. There may come a time. But for science to claim jurisdiction over that which its tools haven't yet gotten good enough to see is as ridiculous as when we look back a few hundred years ago at, you know, our our scientists almost getting hanged for suggesting, merely suggesting that everything might not actually revolve around the earth that actually the earth might not be the center of the universe. When we look back on that and we laugh. But it's such a perfect example of what happens when science refuses to take that deep breath and just kind of lessen its death grip on reality. To say, well, here's, here's what we know with the tools we have now. But we're fully aware of the fact that tomorrow we may end up with better tools and have a completely different take on reality. And then they'd be able, it seems, to be able to work more in concert with spirituality, which actually is happening more and more and more as science and spirituality are starting to overlap. They're starting to want to work more. I mean, they're starting to want to put all kinds of, you know, electrodes on the heads of monks who are meditating and see what happens and, you know, um, which to me is great because it means they're, they're recognizing that there's actually a, a truth there. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, 
you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. So, yes, as we, you've been joining us in satsang for a while, and so, yes, when we've spoken about gurus, it's not essential, meaning that for spiritual awakening, for, spirit, for self-realization, God-realization, all I need is myself, because God God lives within. And so there are examples in our history, in all of the world's traditions, of people who by themselves had experiences of God within them. But as I've mentioned, it's very difficult, which is why I always very sincerely recommend a guru. Because along with God within us, as the truest, wholest, most fundamental aspect of who we are. The real who we are, the rest is just not self. But part of the not self is the ego. And the game that the ego plays is it dresses itself up like self. And it's a lot louder It's a lot louder, it's a lot showier, it's a lot more flamboyant, it's a lot more dramatic than the divine presence within. And so if you've got the ego dressing up in its its costumes of your higher voice, of your divine self, of your true nature, it becomes very difficult sometimes to really distinguish the truth of who we are. And what the guru does, the, the word guru literally means the one who removes the darkness and brings light. And so the guru is the one who is the light that removes that darkness of ego and ignorance. And so now bringing it back to your question, if we live in Shanghai or Milan, what to do? Well, fortunately these days, with engineering being the way it is, with technology being the way it is, you actually have access to gurus, to enlightened masters, to the ones who are the light in so many places. It used to be. It really used to be that you had to only be in a few pockets of the world to be in the presence of the masters. And then, of course, you didn't know that they would necessarily be there when you got there. Maybe they had gone off on a pilgrimage. But these days, technology has really brought us, it's made it so easy for us to travel. It's made it so easy for us to access teachings wherever we are. Now, there is nothing better, and I say this from personal experience, there is nothing better than having the guru right there. But if you are, if you're connected, once you're connected, then wherever you are, you're able to to reconnect. You know, one way, one way of thinking about it is sort of a funny example, but if you think about it, you know, we, we, have, we used to have, and we still have, but now not that many people use them. We used to have a cordless phones all the time, right? And you'd have the base, and you'd charge the phone in the base. And once it was charged, you could take it anywhere because it was still connected back to the base. Now, if you unplugged the base, yeah, you wouldn't get it 
in your handset. But once it was charged in the base, you could go roam around with your cordless phone. This is in a, in a very sort of lighthearted way. Very much what happens when you connect with the guru. Plug yourself in. That connection stays with you. And of course, because what the guru is relying on for the transmission of light is not actually phone waves, it's able to transmit much farther than, you know, the 50 feet or 100 feet that you get with cordless phones. But this is where we keep recharging our batteries, where we keep reconnecting and coming back. So just because we may live in some other city, I wouldn't say give up on the notion of a guru. What you're going to have, a challenge, a great challenge, but the challenge is going to be to hear the guru within you, which is the same challenge that people have if they have a guru who's no longer in their bodies. You know, people have a guru who leaves the body. Or sometimes people connect with a guru who they, they never even knew in the body. And the guru may have lived hundreds of years ago. But they read a book by the guru or about the guru and connect. But that power is so strong that it transcends all of this. But the challenge then for you, I mean, where we are very blessed to literally hear the sound of the words of the guru, the challenge that you get is to actually hear the guru within you. To connect with that within you that has connected to the guru in light. And all of this is very, very, very possible. So do not, do not let go of the idea of a guru. That grace is there for people all over the world. And again, if you can't hear the voice within, that's, that's one of the really unequivocally beneficial things that technology has given us is you can turn on the computer. You can turn on your cell phone and connect with a talk by the guru. You can literally listen to the guru's words if you can't hear them within. You can't see the guru physically. You can't see the guru in your inner eye. Okay. Turn on your computer. Open your phone. There's a picture. There's a video. So, you know, there's so much these days in terms of the controversy about technology, but this, this is really one of the unequivocal positive aspects is it's allowed us those of us who want to use it to connect rather than to distract ourselves, the same technology can actually be used to connect very, very deeply. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. 
Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. You think about someone. You haven't thought about that person in a really long time. You haven't seen them in a really long time. You think about them. Suddenly, out of the blue, that person calls you, shows up. Is that just a coincidence? So let me ask you a question. Let's say that there were an imaginary rope, okay? A string, a rope. And you were holding on to one end and I was holding on to the other end, okay? Just imagine that you and I each have opposite ends of a rope here. Okay. And for a long time, we haven't done anything. We're all, we're just moving through our lives with this rope. Maybe it's tied on our wrist or something and, or on our belt loop or wherever it is. And we, we don't even remember that there's this string. Then one day I jiggle the rope on my side. What's going to happen on your side? You feel it, right? You feel the jiggle. So this is, this is what happens. We're connected. It's not a coincidence. I jiggle my rope. You feel the jiggle. Now, you may not be able to articulate it as I felt a jiggle because the rope is not physical or tangible. But these are the energetic bonds that hold us together. You know, how many people here are parents? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay, so anybody who's a parent here, have you ever had the experience of knowing, knowing at the exact moment that something was going on with your child, whether something physical, whether something emotional, but just just knowing that that was the time to pick up the phone and call? Anybody ever had that experience? Yeah. So... This happens all the time. It happens with siblings all the time. But interestingly, it happens with twins even more. So the tighter the bond is energetically, and when you think about twins, you think literally they spent nine months together in utero. So the bond on a deep, deep cellular energetic level is going to be very, very strong. All the time, these sorts of things happen. So the more deeply connected you are to someone, the more that's going to happen. Chances are it's not going to happen with just some random person. But even with random people, we do have, we've got cords. And if you're sensitive enough, I mean, Puja Swamiji tells stories all the time about, and I've witnessed it so many times, where he'll take somebody's name and they'll call like before he finishes the sentence. And it's not a twin, it's not his mother, it's not a chi- his child, he doesn't have any children. In that case, it is really just a random person. But because his energetic power is so strong, His jiggling is so strong that even if the string that connects you isn't that strong, the person on the other end is going to feel it because the jiggling is so strong. That his energy is that powerful. But I think in general with most of us, it happens much more with people we're really close to. But yeah, this is, we're connected. We're connected. I think of you over here. I jiggle the string over here. You feel it over there. You call me. It's beautiful because it reminds us how how connected we are. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. 
Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Free will absolutely exists. Absolutely. See, I stood up. Sit down. Right? No plans to do that. But you asked. You asked about free will. So I thought, well, let's have a demonstration. Basically, I'm sitting here. Sitting here through the end of satsang. But just to prove a point, I I can do this. I can could dance. We We could do all sorts of things. I could juggle with the microphone. Okay. All sorts of things that you are definitely not planned in terms of when you think of the, the, the plan of the evening of satsang. The question about it comes in with its relationship to karma and destiny. And what we know is that in this moment we have free will. What we don't have, of course, is retrospective free will. So I don't get to rewrite history, which means, of course, I don't get to rewrite where I am in this moment. In this moment is what you could call predetermined, which is the flip side of free will and where the debate comes in. This moment is predetermined. Did you have a choice about being here? No. You were all predetermined to be here. But predetermined how and by what? Well, by all of the choices and decisions that you made in all of the moments of your life leading up to the very moment before you walked in the door to satsang. Are you going to be here tomorrow night? Well, that's based on the decisions you make today. If you get in a bus tonight from Rishikesh to Delhi, no, you're not going to be here with us tomorrow evening. If you decide, oh, I'm here on the banks of Ganga. I've been touched. I've been inspired. Yeah, I was planning to get on the bus, but I'm allowing myself to be touched and I'm going to stay back. You'll be with us. Tomorrow night when we sit here, again, those of you who will be sitting here will be sitting here because you've been predetermined to be here. But that predetermining of tomorrow includes the choices you make now. All the moments prior to now and now. So that which we've done in the past has predetermined my present. That which I'm doing now is predetermining my future. It's not pre as in some very obscure, vague concept of pre. It's just determined prior to the moment. Based on your sanskaras, your your patterns, what type of person you are, We all know we've all got different types of habits. We could all walk into a restaurant and order, you know, 50 different things, 
50 different patterns of living behavior. Those are our sanskaras, our patterns, our habits. But we've also all had different opportunities. We have different sadhana practices. I mean, there's, there's innumerable aspects that go into that predetermining, as well, of course, as your karma. So, for example, if yesterday, prior to arriving here, you robbed a store or a bank and you're running from the police, there's a good chance you won't be here tomorrow night anyway, even if you want to be, because eventually the police are going to catch up with you and throw you in jail. Now, tonight, sitting here, you may decide, ah, I'm touched, I want to stay back. But you no longer actually have that free will because of the choice you made yesterday. You don't get to say to the police when they come to arrest you, oh, but wait, I've changed my mind. I don't want to go to jail. I've been touched. I want to stay and listen to satsang. Too bad. You made a choice yesterday that's determining your tomorrow. So some aspects, I mean, it's all predetermined, but some of the pre is long ago. Some of the pre is immediate. You could, have, you could have gotten to the door and walked away. So some aspects of the predetermination of why you're, why you're here, some are going to go back to your parents, how they raised you, the sanskaras they gave you. Some are going to go back to choices you made a few years ago. Some are going to go back to choices you made a few weeks ago, some a few days ago, some a few hours ago. The sum total of all of that has brought you here. Which means, when we think about our life, since we cannot go backwards, we cannot re- rewind our lives, we have absolutely no control, zero, over the karmic fruit of things we've already done, The only piece of the puzzle that we have any control over is the addition to the karmic package of the choices we make now. And that's what our free will is. So some part of what your tomorrow is going to look like is predetermined. So you're still going to be that same height. You're going to still be the same weight. You're still, I mean, all, all of those things are still going to be there. If you went and got a tattoo today, you'd wake up tomorrow morning with a tattoo. If you got, you know, some part of your body pierced today, you'd wake up tomorrow morning with a hole in that part of your body. So it's not entirely free will. You couldn't wake up in the morning and, you know, decide, I don't want to have any holes in my body. Well, too bad. You've already, you've already done that. But there's a lot a lot that's as yet undetermined. And that's where our free will comes in. So rather than worrying too much about stuff over which we have no control, it's much better to focus our attention on the stuff over which we do have control, which is the choices we're making. And we leave the rest in God's hands. You know, God, you know what I've done. Some of it I don't even know past life stuff. I don't even know. I don't even know all the aspects of my, you know, astrological pieces. God, only you know that. You know my past life stuff. You know my astrology stuff. You know all of this. All I have, the only piece I have is choices I make. So you take care of the choices you have and you leave the rest to God to Take care of the rest. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. (laughs) 